Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In this video, we're going to be looking at the Glasgow Coma Scale. This is an assessment that's used after any head injury or traumatic brain injury to assess cortical functioning, and it's broken into three separate areas. One, we have the eye-opening response. This is more visual response to stimuli. And we have the second, verbal response to stimuli. And then third, we have a motor response to stimuli. And so for example, if we're assessing the eye-opening response, we see here what's the highest level that that patient satisfies at that moment. So if their eyes open spontaneously and they look around the room, um, that's going to be four points. If their eyes only open to verbal command, speech, or shouting, that's three points. If their eyes only open to pain, so if you do some kind of sharp pinprick sensation on a region of their body and then their eyes open, that's a two. And if their eyes don't open at all, that's a one. Now for the verbal responses. If they're oriented, meaning they're not confused at all, they're able to answer questions correctly, that would be five points. Uh, if they're able to answer some questions correctly, but they're still sort of confused about their situation, uh, that would be four points. Now this next one is when they're able to speak. However, when you ask them a question, the response is completely inappropriate. That would be three points. Two points would be if their words are not words. It's just completely nonsensical or incomprehensible sounds, incomprehensible speech. That would be two points. And if there's no verbal response at all, that would be one point. Now, for motor responses, if you command them to move and they're able to do that movement, they obey, in other words, that's six points. So if you ask them to move their arm up, scratch their head, touch their nose, something like that, you know, kind of wiggle their feet, and they can do that, that's, a, that's six points. Now, for five and four points, the difference between these more has to do with whether or not the movement is volitional. Okay? Five points would be awarded if it's purposeful or volitional movement to a painful stimulus, or not toward it, but in response to a painful stimulus. So you give them like a sharp pinprick, and they voluntarily move away from that uh, painful stimulus. That would be five points. But they're not able to follow verbal commands but they do move away from painful stimulus and that movement appears to be voluntary. Now, if you do the same type of painful stimulus and it appears to be more of a withdrawal reflex, so it's not volitional, it's more reflexive, then that would be four points. Three points and two points here would be for the decorticate and decerebrate posturing, okay? Let's do a brief review of what those are. At the top here, we see what's called decerebrate rigidity. And at the bottom here, this is decorticate rigidity. Out of the two of these, decerebrate is the worst prognosis. Um, not that you would want either one of them, but if you had to choose one, you'd probably want decorticate. Uh, if we look back at this graph, notice that a decorticate gets a one more point than decerebrate does. Okay? Now, decerebrate rigidity really results from damage at a level below the red nucleus. The red nucleus is a portion of the midbrain. So the lower midbrain, Damage to that might produce decerebrate rigidity. Also, uh, below the midbrain would be the pons. And there's also damage to the cerebellum that can cause decerebrate rigidity. Uh, what you'll see in decerebrate rigidity would be cervical extension. The jaw is going to be elevated. It's going to be clenched. Also, glenohumeral adduction. The arms are by the side. There will also be quite pronounced elbow extension. It's going to be pretty severe. If you try to manually move their arm into flexion, there's going to be resistance that you're going to have. Okay, It's pretty profound elbow extension. Also, forearm pronation and wrist and digit flexion. The hips will also be extended like you see here and a little bit internally rotated. Also, quite severe knee extension. Just like with the elbows, the knees will also be in quite a bit of extension. Very hard to get out of that extension. And the ankles will be plantar flexed. Okay? That's decerebrate rigidity. Then we have decorticate rigidity, which really results from damage above the level of the red nucleus in the midbrain. So in contrast to the lower midbrain for decerebrate, now we're looking at upper midbrain and things above that, like the thalamus, the internal capsule and then regions of the cerebral hemisphere, really just below the cerebral hemispheres. Okay? Uh, one very big difference between these two, can you spot it? In decorticate rigidity, the elbows are flexed. 
Elbows are flexed here, okay, where they're very sharply extended in decerebrate rigidity. The other thing is, is that in decerebrate rigidity, that knee extension is pretty sharp. It's going to be very difficult to get out of knee extension. It won't be as much knee extension in decorticate rigidity. Okay, so it'll still be extended, but not quite as much resistance uh, to flexion as you see in decerebrate rigidity. But the big difference here are the flexed elbows in decorticate rigidity. So how do you tell the difference between the two of these? Well, obviously, decerebrate rigidity up here has elbow extension. But then if we compare the knees, there's sharper knee extension in uh, decerebrate rigidity. And if you look at the two words, decerebrate and decorticate, how many E's does decorticate have? Two. How many does decerebrate have? One, two, three, four. And so the way that most people remember this is decerebrate has more E's, E for extension. So there's more extension in decerebrate rigidity. There's less ease in decorticate, so this one is the one with flexion, okay, and less extension at these particular joints, okay. So decerebrate rigidity, more extension, right. And with either of these, they're typically going to have a poor prognosis. And normally, if the person dies, it's going to be due to cardiac arrhythmia, cardiac arrest, or respiratory failure. And that poor prognosis is represented in these scores, meaning the decorticate posturing has three points in the motor response and decerebrate posturing has two points. And if the person has absolutely no motor response, so basically just complete flaccidity, that's one point. And so you assign a score for all three of these areas. So you should have three individual scores at the end, and then you just add the scores to get a total score. And then you look at the total score and you can group it into one of these ranges to figure out how severe the brain injury is. When we look at a minor or mild traumatic brain injury, that'll have a score of 13 to 15. Moderate brain injury will be 9 to 12, and then severe will be 3 to 8. One thing to notice about this is as you go higher and higher, you get a better prognosis. The lower the score is, the worse the prognosis is. So now let's look at a couple of practice questions. And this first one is an NPTE practice question. All right, we have a patient with a suspected head injury it is assessed using the Glasgow Coma Scale. The medical record indicates the patient has maintained a score of six for more than six hours. What is the most appropriate classification of severity using the scale? Okay. So this person has a score of six. Now, if you knew these ranges right here for minor, moderate, and severe, all you'd need to do is figure out where does six fall. Well, it falls between three and eight, so this would actually be a severe brain injury. But what if, what if, you didn't have any of that memorized? How would you figure out the answer to this question? Well, on the NPTE, if you have two answers that are pretty much identical, you can get rid of them. In this case, we can get rid of A and B. Why is that? Well, a mild head injury, which is also a mild traumatic brain injury, is synonymous with concussion. Okay? This is from a neuro course. So a mild head injury or mild TBI and concussion are the same thing. Well, it clearly can't be either of those because it would have to be both of them, right? So we're going to get rid of both of those answers, eliminate A and B. Now at this point, we have two answers remaining, C and D. That's a 50% chance of getting the question right, much better than 25% before we eliminated the first two. And if you didn't have any knowledge of these ranges or you just forgot them, had a brain fart, you probably would have to take a guess. Okay? But 50% is better than 25%. So that being said, the answer, remember, was severe head injury because 6 falls between 3 and 8. And so you use the ranges. But one tip that can help you with not just this scale but a lot of them is only memorize the middle range. Okay? Most things are going to have three ranges. Okay. So you memorize the one in the middle, which is moderate brain injury, 9 to 12 points. And then you just need to know if a higher score is good or bad. And so if I know that a higher score is good and the moderate brain injury is 9 to 12, that must mean that 13 and higher is good or minor, and less than 8 would be severe or bad. Okay. So that being said, the score of 6 is less than 9. And a lower score is bad, higher score is good, so that must mean it's a severe head injury. Or you could look at it from the perspective that you memorize the moderate range, the middle one, that's 9 to 12, so we've already ruled out A and B. It can't be moderate, because it's 
not between 9 and 12, so by process of elimination it'd have to be severe head injury. So when it comes to these ranges, a good tip, because it's going to be hard to memorize everything, memorize the one in the middle and then just know if a higher score is good or bad, and you can deduce the other parts or the other ranges. Let's look at one more example. We want to classify this patient on the Glasgow Coma Scale following a TBI. The patient does not open eyes to family members, but does open eyes with a strong pinprick on the Achilles tendon region, in addition to slowly moving their leg away from the pin. Patient can speak discernibly, but the words make no logical sense. Right? So how do we classify them? Well, we look at each of these three areas and assign a score. Let's look at the visual response or eye-opening response. Okay? So for eye-opening response, patient does not open eyes to family members. If family members are probably talking to this person. Uh, there's speech, right? They're not opening eyes to that. So we're probably not looking at a four or a three. It's going to be less. But they do open their eyes with a strong pinprick on the Achilles tendon region. A pinprick is pain. Okay? That's through that spinal thalamic tract to the brain, right? pain. So they open the eyes to pain. Right? The fact that they do open their eyes to something negates a 1, so this is obviously going to be a 2. Right? What about for verbal response? If you go to the last sentence here, the patient can speak discernibly, but the words make no logical sense. Okay, so the people are probably asking them questions, and they're talking in actual words or sentences, but they do not match the question. So this would be like, you ask them what year it is, and they respond red. Red is a word, but it has nothing to do with the question. Completely inappropriate response. Okay? The fact that they have discernible words negates a two, because that would be if the speech was completely incomprehensible, basically just gibberish. Okay? So it's not a two. It's going to be a three for verbal response to stimuli. Now for the motor response. So we did that pinprick sensation on the Achilles tendon region. They move their leg away from the pin, so away from the pain. But how do we know? Is it five or four? The key word here is slowly moving the leg away from the pin. If this were a, a spinal reflex, a reflex that goes through the spinal cord, like the withdrawal reflex, it would probably be a pretty quick movement. The fact that it slowly indicates that it's probably not a reflex, it's probably volitional. And so I ended up changing that at the last minute. This is not a four. A four would be if it was a quick, kind of reflexive movement from the spinal cord. This is actually going to be a five. Okay, so that's a purposeful volitional movement. The slow nature of that movement indicates that it's probably volitional. Okay, and so now the total score is actually going to be 10. Okay, 2 plus 3 is 5 plus 5 is 10. And so 10 falls into that moderate range of 9 to 12. So this is still going to be a moderate traumatic brain injury. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the Glasgow Coma Scale, um, how it's divided up, and what it's used for. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.